and it looks like we're live so hello everyone um welcome back to my channel i'm actually going to do the uh channel intro this time which i completely forgot to do um before my tv and film video a moment ago so hi i'm nikki i'm an author and editor and i post videos here on youtube about writing editing reading and all the other things i love and it's reading we're here for now because it is the end of the month and it's time to give you my wrap up of the books i've been reading as always there are quite a few so i am going to zoom straight on in uh kicking us off 20 years after by alexandra dumas uh, now for those of you who may know the three musketeers novel this is actually a sequel set as the title suggests 20 years after uh, the events of that first book and once again, our hero is D'Artagnan, and he's become estranged from the other musketeers. Um, they've all gone in different directions, they're off doing different things. But then the Cardinal, uh, Mazarin this time, not Richelieu, um, comes to him with a job, and it involves getting the band back together, or trying to anyway, because unfortunately in the current conflict, for a little while at least, they are all on separate sides. So, um, I don't want to give too much of the story away. Um, it does involve Milady's son who wishes to avenge his mother's death and there were all the usual court machinations going on i gave it five stars it's great adventure great fun um perhaps not quite as memorable as the events of the first book but it's still engaging and it's still a really great quick read and if you're wary about trying classics i would actually recommend Dumas because although his books look fairly hefty they are pretty easy reading and they're pretty quick paced as well so it's not a lot of bogging down with details or anything like that. The action gets straight off to the start, um, right from page one. So moving on, you have to excuse me, I just feel like I need to sneeze. So if I suddenly do in a minute, apologies for that. Um, moving on uh, to two more books. Now these two I got as um, secondhand books from a book sale at the State Library in the city. And um, the first of these is The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Canterbury Tales, I've read bits and pieces here and there. It's one of those things where you come across certain of the stories that you've maybe looked at for an English course or something, but without reading the whole thing. So this was my first time actually sitting down and reading the entirety from beginning to end. Um, I really enjoyed it, full stars. Um, there are some really wonderful stories here, but it interested me that the ones that I do tend to know are the best ones, uh, the funniest ones, the most rebelled ones, one or two of the others that I hadn't read before are actually a little bit dull, which is probably why I've not come across them in other situations, because they're probably left out for a reason. So, um, but anyway, as an overall though, um, overall book, I do recommend it. Um, I mean, I read it in the Middle English, but there were notes um, at the side to help you with any of the difficult vocabulary. But if that kind of puts you off, then there are, I, I do know, versions out there that have been rendered in modern English to make things easier for you. Next up was The House of the Spirits by Isabel Alinda. Um, this one actually crossed off um, another country in my world challenge, which I will talk to you about in a little bit. And I gave this four and a half stars. This is a really difficult book to describe without ruining the story. Essentially, it's a family drama told over the course of about three generations. However, there's a huge amount of magical realism involved as well, with people predicting the future and various magical things going on. Uh, as I said, I can't spoil it, but um, it was a fascinating read. It was really engaging. It was very different. The prose was easy reading, and I would recommend this if you like um, historical novels but with magical realism and a deep family drama as the sort of uh, root or the stem of everything that's going on moving on um i've got all these spread over like various pages in the book so i'm just having to scan for the ones i've written eight for next to um next up is a net galley read anyway it's the office of gardens and ponds by didier de Croix. Uh, it's a french author so translated work uh, a French author and the story is set in Japan and we open the story and a, a guy who is a fisherman who has been providing the koi carp for the pools in the palace um, in the emperor's um, the emperor's special koi carp if you like uh, he's died and he has an order that's meant to be going out to the emperor 
So it's decided that, the, you know, the village can't afford to lose this royal patronage. So they decide to send the wife in his stead. So the story is essentially her journey from her village, which she's never left, out to the emperor's palace, trying to negotiate with the officials and various people she meets along the way in order to present these carp and get the money that her village desperately needs. This is another one where I don't really want to ruin it by saying too much, but I gave it five stars. It was a really atmospheric, a very lyrical piece. Uh, you absolutely get swept up in, in the story and in the world building and in this character as well, this woman who's, you know, she's got no experience. She's just out there trying to get the job done, if you like, and managing things as best she can. So if, if that sounds like your sort of thing, again, this it's not as strong magical realism as the House of the Spirits that I just mentioned, but there is a little bit of a vague element of it here and there as well in this story. So uh, if that's your thing, if you like Japanese culture, um, this is definitely one to check out. Next up, The Miniaturist by Jesse Burton. This one I came to after having seen the TV adaptation, which was on in England um, when I was over there visiting my family um, back, not this last Christmas, the one before. And I really loved it uh, on the TV and I was fascinated by the story. So I've been keen for a while to read the original book and I finally got around to doing so. And again, this was another five star read for me. It's a really fascinating story. It's absolutely captivating. Um, just to give you a very brief overview, again, trying not to spoiler it, uh, a young woman who lived out in the country was married to uh, a merchant who's living in the capital. And so she's, they got married, but he went off ahead and she's now coming to meet him and to take over her role as his wife, as the head of the household, except uh, things don't go quite the way she planned. Uh, in the house, she finds everything being lorded over by uh, her new husband's sister. And there's this uh, deep atmosphere of foreboding and secrets um, going on. Um, he's not behaving to her the way she would have expected. And in the end, to try and occupy her, he buys her this really elaborate uh, miniature house and tells her that she can fill the house with, you know, items that she's got some money, spending money, she can buy little bits of furniture and dolls and various things for this house. At first she's quite rather insulted because she, you know she's not a child anymore, but then she finds a miniaturist to make these items and through the miniaturist um, the story evolves because the miniaturist seems to know things about the household that Nella doesn't know herself. So again it's, it's a lot of mystery going on so I can't spoil it by saying too much more but it was a very captivating and engaging read. And so I definitely recommend that if you like historical um, drama, essentially it's, it's not really romance per se, uh, historical drama more, but with, again, this just a little nudge of magical realism here and there that makes you question what's real and what isn't. Next up, another one that I've been longing to read for ages and finally got around to, The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. And this was once again, a five star read for me. I thought it was an absolutely glorious retelling. I loved um, loved the, um, the sense we get of Achilles, um, the sense we get of the action going on and all told from the viewpoint of um, Patroclus, who is such a fascinating character and he's always on the sidelines in most retellings. So it's wonderful to get something from his point of view. Um, you could call this MM historical, um, as well, because obviously there is that relationship between him and Achilles. And again, it was just really captivating, even though I know the story and I knew what was gonna happen to whom at what point, uh, I was still really keen to turn the page and find out what was gonna go on next and what Patroclus was gonna make of um, these new events. So I definitely recommend that again, if you're a historical fiction fan. Next up is a book I received as an ARC ebook. Um, from the publisher and it's called Asylum and it's written by Marcus Lowe. Now this was a three star read for me. It's basically the tale of um, this young man, there's kind of a bit of a uh, post-apocalyptic feel, there's been this virus, some people have been shut away. It was a really interesting idea um, but for me it just didn't grip me, the, the telling of it and the character, I never really came to care about him much. 
and it just felt that there was some great action moments and but then it, the pacing would really slow down so um if that sort of thing interests you that this idea of like you know virus and people being shut away because they're contagious and that kind of thing um interests you then you should probably check the book out i think you might find something you enjoy in it but it's not one that i um, would desperately recommend if that's not your sort of thing to begin with next up was annette galley reed creative lettering and beyond by laura lavender um, four stars for me this was an another good book of its ilk i mean you're, you're seen or heard me um reviewing other books like this before and again i think it, it's it was nicely presented um plenty of good information plenty of good examples um well set out within the book uh, with areas where you could do some practice and things like that so if you're into lettering this is another uh, another good book in the field that you might want to take a look at and I desperately need a quick sip of drink. So bear with me for two seconds. Oh, and that's still a bit hot. <laughs> Maybe I don't need it that much. Um, next up was an arc I received from the publisher in print format. And it's How It Feels to Float by Helena Fox. This is a book about a young woman who has some um, mental health issues and how she is dealing with those um, and dealing with the world around her throughout the course of the story. Um, again, I, I kind of don't want to ruin the story by saying too much, but it was a very thoughtful piece. I thought it was a very compassionate piece. I thought it was well written, well researched, and it presented things in, in a good light, um, in a realistic light. So if, if you like, this is, is a YA essentially, and if you like those sort of contemporary YAs, a, a little bit deeper thought provoking works, then this is one I recommend and I gave it four stars. Next up, How to Read and Interpret Runes by Andy Baggett. This is a book I picked up in a $5 bookstore. Um, I do like to consult runes every now and again, so I thought it would be nice. Um, mostly I've got just little flashcards that I got through a magazine subscription that was a Mind, Body, Spirit magazine like ages ago, years and years back. Um, so I thought it might be nice just to have um, some more definitions and interpretations in a book. And it also gives you a few different spreads that you can try as well. Uh, it gives you a little bit of background on runes, um, runic writing, and it also talks about how to create your own set of runes if you don't want to use a store-bought one. So I thought it, it's a fairly simple, um, fairly light book. It's not very long, but I thought I gave it um, four stars because I think it, it's a good overview with some um, good tips and interpretations. Uh, next up, also from the $5 bookstore, was Sewing Techniques by Dorothy Wood. And again, I gave this four stars. This is very much an overview work. So it looks at things like hemming, um, sewing on buttons, um, doing a bit of machining, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of it is pretty obvious and straightforward and it's stuff that I already knew. But um, one thing I've always been really bad at is darning. So I, <laughs> I saw they had a section on darning in there. So I did, I bought it mostly for that, to be honest. So if I want to darn, I can try to do less of a rubbish job of it in the future. And so I think it is a good overview. It doesn't go into much detail on anything, but if you're just looking for the basics, if you're just starting out and you just want to know how to basically put a zipper on, do a few little bits and pieces like that, then it's a good book. Um, four stars I gave it, I think I already said, but in case I didn't. Um, moving along. The next thing I read was another NetGalley book and it was The Immortal City by Amy Kuvalainen. Um, now, this is a book that is a kind of fantasy murder mystery, I guess you'd say, and it all revolves around the lost city of Atlantis. Um, once again, I do not want to spoiler the story, so I'm not gonna say too much more about it. Um, I gave it three stars. I thought it was okay. I liked the idea. Um, I liked the, the um, plot, essentially, in its basic format. However, I never really felt any menace about the murders um, and our lead heroine uh, is attacked and kidnapped and all sorts of various times and yet I never actually was worried about her because I knew she'd get out of it somehow, usually rescued by the hero. And the other thing that kind of put me off a little bit was that there's some Italian in it, it's set in Venice, and I don't think the Italian was all correct. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm 100% fluent Italian, but I have studied it and in one sentence in particular, there was definitely a Spanish word instead of the Italian equivalent, um, for example. 
So uh, that kind of put me off. It's like if you want to use foreign language in a book, fine, but make sure you've got it right. Next up was a book I received from Simon and Trista here in Australia. And I actually entered a giveaway for some um, advanced copies, which I was fortunate enough to win for two books, which are the next two I'm going to discuss. So first up is Slayer by Kirsten White which for those not in the know is the new, uh, kicking off the new series of novels based in the world of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So Buffy does appear in the book very briefly, but it's actually focused on another new Slayer. Um, one of the last ones created just before Buffy destroys magic, which is a storyline that happens in the graphic novels. So I gave this three stars again. Um, I thought it was okay. Um, Buffy fans will probably enjoy revisiting the world. There are references to events and characters from the TV series and graphic novels. So if you've been following it all the way through the TV and graphic novel stages, then um, you'll like those little um, nudges and winks going on. However, it kind of lacked spark for me. I never really came to love um, our new Slayer. Um, I thought the ending in particular um, was a little bit of a cop out. Um, again, I don't want to spoil it, so I'm not going to say um, what the ending was, but uh, I just felt it was a, a, just a little bit contrived, perhaps is the word for it. And I must just have a quick hello to my friend Alina, who is watching live. Hi, Alina. Um, and I will now move on to my other Simon and Schuster uh, giveaway win, which was The Red Scrolls of Magic, which is by Cassandra Clare and Wesley Chu. Um, this is obviously set within the uh, Shadowhunters world. Now, I will confess I haven't read all of the Shadowhunter books. I read the first book, um, City Bones, and I've seen the film, and I've seen the first two seasons of the Netflix series. And I have read, actually, before I forget, the Infernal Devices trilogy, which is my favourite of the bits of hers I've read so far which was a Victorian era setting of Shadowhunter stories with a bit of a steampunk element. And I think I enjoyed that more than the contemporary setting of the sort of main uh, Mortal Instruments series. I wanted to read this one because its uh, principal characters are Magnus and Alec. And Magnus was actually the reason I kept watching to season two of the Netflix series, because I do love him as a character, even though the series I thought was a bit average. So I was looking forward to this book. And in the end, I gave it a three and a half stars. There was nothing wrong with it per se. It was entertaining. It was great to have fun with Magnus. Um, he is such a, a brilliant, amusing character. But I kind of thought it lacked depth at times. It was good fun, but I, I wanted to get a bit more uh, into the characters, a bit more into the, their emotions, the psychological response. And, and this is the beginning of a series. So we know that the story is going to continue on into a book two. Um, and I did like the sort of plot idea of Magnus's parentage possibly becoming an issue for him in the future. I would read on in the series, but I wouldn't rush out to buy it the second it releases. I'd wait until I could pick up a copy at the library or something like that. Um, and I would carry on. But for me, definitely Infernal Devices is still, that, that's the, if you're going to try Shadowhunters, that's the one I would recommend. So moving along, um, I do need more drink. Hopefully it's cooled down a bit more than when I tried to take that last sip and nearly had to spit it out all over you. That's better. I can bear it now. A um, Hundred Faces and Figures, which is a net galley read, and it's written by Chris Legaspi. Um, this is an art book, essentially, non-fiction. It's really based more on people looking to do cartoon-style art. It is line drawing, essentially. So drawing faces just as lines, not anything to do with shading or realism, um, essentially. Um, not that sort of hyper-realism, anyway. Um, for what it is, I thought it was really good um, reference work. I gave it four stars. There's not a lot of description going on. Um, there's a few pages talking about technique at the start of the book. However, the bulk of it is these 100 figures and faces, each of which you see in various stages from drawing the first line to completion. So that if you wanted to, as an artist, you could attempt them yourself and go through those different stages. So if that's the kind of thing you're into for your art, if you're looking at that cartoon graphic style drawing of faces and figures, and you just want something where you can copy and practice, this is the book for you. 
The next up is a book that I received as a gift from a friend. She'd actually intended to gift it to me for my birthday, but uh, she was shipping it from England and with various things going on in her life as we went through Christmas and New Year, she only got around to sending it to me this month. And it's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Other Stories by Washington Irving. Now I have read The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and the Rip Van Winkle stories before, so those were not new to me. However, all the other stories included were. I gave this four stars overall. It's a really fun collection of tales. I mean, Sleepy Holly, Sleepy Holly, Sleepy Hollow, if I can speak, is definitely the standout one amongst them. But I was also really interested in Washington Irving's um, little pieces based on his time in England, talking about um, various places in London, um, and also about Christmas traditions in England in the 19th century. So um, that one was really enjoyable. Um, four star read. If you're into um, classic American fiction, uh, give it a go. Um, I should perhaps point out very briefly that Sleepy Hollow um, is nothing like the Tim Burton film. If all you know of Sleepy Hollow is the Tim Burton film, you probably will be a bit disappointed in this story because Tim Burton really just did his own thing in that film. And I enjoy it, it's a fun film, but the original story is absolutely nothing like that. So please don't expect anything too supernatural going on if you give this book a try. Uh, and Alina's just pointed out to me that Sleepy Holly could work as a Christmas story, so that's perhaps a potential um, future title um, that we can write for an advent calendar call for Dream Spinner Press or something. <laughs> Next up is A Single Man by Christopher Isherwood. This is a book that I com I'm coming to after seeing the film, and I really enjoyed the film, and the book was no exception. I gave it five stars. It's a really beautiful story. Um, George R main character is a gay man, he's living in 1960s America, although he's English, and he's just lost his lover in a tragic accident. And it's basically how he's trying to cope with that and carry on. And <laughs> Alina's just sending me some more amusing uh, comments about horror stories as well. Um, but uh, getting back to George, <laughs> he's, um, he's a really engaging character. I really felt for him right from the start. I really got caught up in his world, um, particularly his emotional, his inner world. Um, and we see, you know, we see him laid out all his faults, um, his good points, his bad points, everything. And uh, yeah, you should definitely read the book, Alina, because um, I really enjoyed it as much as the film. And you, you definitely get a really wonderful sense of his inner life um, in the, the book that I don't think always comes across quite as well in the film. So yeah, as I said, it's a five star read for me. I've actually got another um, Christopher Isherwood book here, which I'm hopefully gonna read during May, hopefully next week sometime probably. So I'll talk to you about that one next time. Um, this one I'm gonna be reading next is actually the one that the musical Cabaret is based on. So that should be interesting. So uh, we're, we're steaming towards the end people. We're down to about the last six to go. <laughs> Uh, next up is Complete Fairy Tales by Charles Perrault. So this is the French version of classic fairy tales such as um, Little Reviding Hood and the like. And um, I gave it five stars. It's a really good collection. Actually, what worked best for me about this was the notes that were included in the book, particularly those that looked at how this differs from other versions, um, from other French writers and other people like the Brothers Grimm and things like that. So if you're a fairy tale fan and you like folklore, um, this is definitely one for the collection because it just gives you a slightly different take on some of the tales like Sleeping Beauty and that with maybe slightly different endings or uh, different things going on in them than the versions you may know from Disney and the like. Uh, next up, in a similar theme, is an anthology of English folk tales. Uh, this book appealed to me because it was a collection of tales all taken from different counties. Um, for those who aren't in the know about England, our country is split into counties. Um, I personally come from Kent, which is in the southeast, just below London. And I was actually a little bit upset because there was no Kent story included. But I see that this uh, same publisher have a, has a series of books. This was just like a sort of a collection from one of each from different places. But they have books for the specific counties with just stories from those areas. So I may have to get myself later on the Kent book um, for some regional tales from my own area of the world. But this, on the whole, was a nice collection. I gave it four stars, and the only reason it didn't get five was because a few of the tales included were actually a little bit modern for my liking. They were really folklore-inspired tales, or folktale-inspired stories, if you like. 
that the authors had penned rather than ones that they'd gathered that have been around for two centuries or whatever. And I kind of felt that in a collection like this, I wanted those ones that had been around for at least a hundred years or so, um, that felt like they were real classic pieces from the area, not just that they were inspired by folklore style stories, but were more modern. Um, but that was only really maybe two of them, um, two or three. The rest of them were um, more classic tales. Uh, a few of them I recognised. In fact, Chaucer stole a couple of them um, in Canterbury Tales, which I was reading earlier in the month. Uh, I was reading a couple and I was like, this sounds very familiar. <laughs> and then I realised it was um, because that's where it's come from, where Chaucer's got it from originally as a folk tale that he's then had one of his characters tell um, as part of his Canterbury Tales. So, yeah, if you're inter interested in English folklore anyway, uh, it's probably a nice one to pick up because it does give you some stories from all different parts of the country. And almost finally, I'm going to say almost finally because I'm coming back at the end for a trilogy that I want to talk about in a bit more detail. So um, this is the last of the sort of non-trilogy books, which I just finished actually only a couple of days ago. And it's called Skin and it's an ebook arc I received from the publisher. Uh, this actually releases tomorrow. Um, my review is going up on my blog tomorrow, but I thought I'd just talk about it today as I did finish it. And we're only a few hours away from the review going live. It's written by Liam Brown. And essentially, it's a sci-fi post-apocalyptic story. Um, there's been a virus which has basically rendered the human race um, allergic to each other. So any contact outside of hazmat suits is off because you'll just end up um, being unable to breathe and choking to death. Um, so that's the basic premise. Um, so even families, um, they all each have their own room in which they live, shut off from each other. If they they're not really allowed outside at all, but if they go out, um, our main character is a member of the Neighbourhood Watch. So she is allowed to take a hazmat suit and go out for an hour once a week to patrol the neighbourhood. And when she comes back, she has to go through decont decontamination and sit in this little tent for an hour or so until she's allowed back in. And, and the government ships in their food once a week. And um, she's out on this Neighbourhood Watch one day when she comes across a man uh, who is out and about not wearing a hazmat suit and apparently alive so um again i'm not gonna say too much more to spoiler it but uh, she ends up wondering what's going on and following him and a story in shoes and at the same time there's a lot of drama going on within her family um they're all kind of breaking apart and they've all got their own problems going on and none of them really know how to relate to each other anymore because they only see each other via webcam so it was a really fascinating premise, I thought. I gave it four stars in the end. I liked it. I kind of wanted once or twice a little bit more detail about the characters and their feelings. Um, but as the story went, it was enjoyable. It kept me interested. It kept me turning the pages. It's a little bit open-ended, so it doesn't really end with a definitive answer of what's been going on and what's going to happen. It kind of leaves it up in the air a little bit for you to make your own decision about um, what the truth was at the end of it. So that brings me to the final trilogy I want to talk about, um, which after I've had a bit more drink, because I'm just talking myself hoarse at the moment. OK, so I want to talk about Catherine Arden's Winter Night Trilogy. Um, now, Aline has already heard me um, rabbiting on about this to her. Uh, so now you all get to put up with it as well. Aren't you lucky? Uh, I should say, I came to this trilogy in a roundabout way because uh, last year I requested a copy on NetGalley of The Girl in the Tower, uh, not realising because it didn't make it clear in the little spiel on the NetGalley page that it was the second book in a trilogy. When I got it, I discovered that, um, but I did carry on and read it and I really enjoyed it. However, I kind of felt that there were bits of storyline that I could have done with knowing. So I'd always intended to eventually come back and read book one. And then I saw that book three was finally releasing. So I decided this was a good opportunity uh, to get them all. Um, I knew I wanted to get the second book again because I loved it so much. So I decided just to buy the whole trilogy. At first I bought the first two because I was hoping to wait until the October mass market release for the third book. Um, so they were all the same size on the shelf because I'm like that. But actually, when I started reading the first two again, I decided I absolutely couldn't wait. So I had to dash into town and just get the trade size um, paperback of the third book so I could read it straight away. 
So for those who don't know this series, um, the three books are The Bear and the Nightingale, The Girl in the Tower and The Winter of the Witch. And these are books set in and based on folklore of Russia. And a kind of medieval Russia, essentially. Um, so if you're familiar at all with Russian folklore, during the course of these three books, um, you'll come across the Firebird, Baba Yaga, uh, and all those little Russian house spirits like the Domovoy um, and their stable and um, other area equivalents, um, front door, gate guards, and various things like that. Uh, also, Rizalki, uh, water sprites, and that, that kind of thing. So if that's um, something that appeals to you, then I think you'll love this series. Um, Alina is probably waiting for me at the moment to start talking about Morozko, which I'm going to do right now, Alina. Um, <laughs> because for me, the absolute like, best thing about this book is Morozko, who is the Winter King. And he's, in terms, if you're familiar with sort of English um, folklore figures, he's almost a kind of blend between the Holly King, Jack Frost, and the Grim Reaper. Um, as bizarre as that sounds, but that's what his character is. He's kind of a death god. He also controls the frost, and he's also um, kind of the king of the winter, autumn, winter seasons. He brings frost and snow and things like that. And he's also um, a major player in the story. And it, the story actually revolves around a young girl called Vasya, who is a witch. Um, she doesn't know it at the time um, as a young child, but that's the reason she can see. Or well, yeah, thanks, Alina. I knew you'd be waiting for it. Um, <laughs> that's the reason that she can see all the Domovoy and the other house sprites. And it's a difficult time because all these creatures are fading because Christianity's taken over and people are not um, leaving out bread for them and thinking of them as much as they used to. Uh, so the Winter King is fading and he is looking for a way to stop that, which is how he comes in contact first with Vasya. And along the way, um, again, I'm, I'm just trying not to spoil it too much, but essentially this story is um, a almost like a made up fairy tale, but it incorporates Russian folklore. And it also incorporates a few historical events and personages, um, given a bit of a supernatural twist, of course, or a fantasy twist, of course. But um, there are some battles and things that go on, particularly in the final book, that are actually historical events. Um, this series as a whole absolutely captivated me. I mean, I gave five stars to all three books <laughs> pretty much, didn't I? Yes, I did. Um, so I think that tells you all you need to know about how I felt about this series. But um, it is wonderful. Um, it's great to see the use of folklore outside the standard stuff we're seeing all the time with fairy tale retellings and that, um, using the Russian um, characters and um, is just a little bit different, a bit more interesting. And it, it gives it a really great sense of uh, atmosphere as well in that, that sort of sense of the cold Russian winters and things that uh, during which the story takes place. Um, it's hard to say exactly what I love most about these books, and I, I'm going to waffle on about them for a few more minutes, so bear with me. Um, <laughs> It's just, they just really stuck with me. I mean, I actually found myself having to grab the book and every now and again go, Cory, my, my husband, listen to this and just read him out bits. Um, also, also, I was doing that from books in the wrong order. So he got really irate with me. He was like, when, what's this from? I was like, book three. And then the next day I'd be like, listen to this. And I'd read him a bit and he's like, when's this from? Book one. <laughs> um, mostly Morozko stuff. He's like rolling his eyes at me all the time. Uh, but I did absolutely fall in love with Morozko as a character. Um, and I think that's that was one of the biggest draws of the book for me because I loved him so much. And um, yeah, I mean, I won't waffle on too much more because I don't want to spoil the books if anyone hasn't read them. Um, but I definitely highly recommend them. And I've read a few that I've given five stars to this month. Um, things like The Miniaturist, Song of Achilles, all those I'd recommend. But if I was only going to say one book or one series that I recommend from this month's reading, it would be this one. If you haven't read it yet, definitely. Go out and grab a copy if you love fantasy, if you love fairy tale retellings, if you love folklore. Uh, it's definitely a series for you. So um, now I've given Catherine Arden a huge plug. <laughs> um, that's yeah. I do hope she writes some more actually because I, I did enjoy her writing style as well. There were a few comma splices here and there, but it, honestly, the story was so good I was able to ignore them, um, which isn't usual for me. <laughs> but uh, I could put up with them because of Morosco. Um, so. Yes, that brings me pretty nicely, I guess, to the end of my reading for April. Um, as a, it's been a, a usual sort of month for me, 
I've got a few um, coming up in May. I'm actually quite near the end of my TBR pile at the moment, but I've got a few requests waiting on NetGalley and things like that. So if one or two of those come in, that will keep me going through May. I've also got a fairly busy May as well, so I may read a little bit less next month than I usually do. But I'm so epically ahead on um, my reading challenge, it doesn't matter. I think I'm up to about 86 books out of my 150 for the year now. Um, I completely finished my um, own reading challenge, the MJM reading challenge. There we go. I'll pop that there for you. All ticked off, all done. Um, one category, I did use one of my own books, which I don't know if that's cheating, but I've been rereading it about three times because I'm editing it. So um, I, I feel, well, I think it counts. I read it and read it and read it. So um, that one's all done anyway. Um, and it, I mean, even if I didn't include that one, I, I'd read another book that covers that category by the end of the year. So uh, it's all finished anyway. I'm um, just double checking my Around the World reading challenge. And yes, as I mentioned, The House of the Spirits by Isabel Alenda um, satisfied my Peru category. Um, although she didn't grow up in Peru, she was born there. So uh, I can cross that off for her. And I think that was the only new one for April. Oh, no, I totally lie. Um, uh, that Asylum one by Marcus Lowe that I mentioned a little while back, that was um, a South African one. So that crosses off South Africa too. So I've crossed off two more from my World Reading Challenge in the course of the month as well. So on that note, I am going to close. Um, I've had this completely frantic day. I've been house cleaning. It's the last dry day. We've got a ton of rain coming. So I've been doing about three batches of washing, cleaning the whole house, going to the shops, trying to catch up from where I was out watching Endgame in the middle of the day yesterday. And I'm still going. It's four o'clock here now and I've still got stuff to do. So I should end on that note. And um, just be thankful I managed to get this done on time and I will zoom off and get a few other bits and pieces done before dinner time but as always I'll be back again soon um, in fact I am back a little bit earlier than usual because I'm just double checking my days um, yes Tuesday the 7th I will be doing drama talk with my friend Alina so I do hope you will join us for that we are talking about um, manga and graphic novels this time so do come and join us then. It'll be 2.30 my time here in Adelaide, Australia. Um, I have no idea when that is for anyone else. Sorry, <laughs> you'll have to work it out yourselves. Um, but whatever time it is now, <laughs> go back an hour and a half and that's when it will be on Tuesday the 7th. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you all again then. And bye for now, everyone. <laughs>